All right, so uh, this is a little bit later than I said it was going to be, but this is the week three recap video. Uh, so first, since it was during week three that I assigned the thesis articulation assignment, I want to discuss that a little bit. Um, so hopefully you're all able to see not only the um, sort of prefabricated feedback that comes from the grading rubric, rubric that I used, but also my individualized feedback. So for most people, there should be you know, a set of numbers one, two, three, four, five, where I talk about each of your theses uh, and give you some indication of what you did well, uh, what you might want to think about going forward if you were to develop that particular thesis, or um, some things that you did uh, sort of wrong in terms of structuring it as a thesis. So uh, you'll notice that there, as I said, there was, there's rubric feedback. Um, rubric feedback you will also see for all of the, most of the other assignments in week three as well. Um, I'll be moving to using this rubric stuff more as we go forward. Uh, now that you should have a fairly decent idea of what I'm looking for in terms of the assignments, um, the standard uh, prefabricated feedback a helps me grade things faster and you know sort of it will normalize the grades across people so I just sort of I have these pre-built um, ways of grading where I click a sort of little check a box and it will say how well you completed the assignment there are sort of four levels of completion for each of the criteria different assignments have different numbers of criteria it's usually between one and four. So for instance, you see in the thesis assignment, there are two levels of feedback, completion and mastery, and each has four levels. Uh, so for the completion one, it was just how many thesis uh, statements did you give me? Uh, for the most part, everyone gave me five like they were supposed to. If you had given me four, then you would have gotten fewer points on completion and the little feedback would have said, uh, provided four theses. Um, <clears throat> then there was the mastery part, and that was the one which was more substantive, uh, and so the feedback is also more descriptive. It says uh, whether or not you learned the difference between a topic and a thesis. So you recall in my instructions, I tell you, well, a topic is, you know, the thing you're talking about or the question you're answering, and then the thesis is your answer to that question or your statement about that topic. So if I gave you feedback to the effect of, um, you are simply re-describing or defining the thesis, excuse me, the topic, then that was an indication that you didn't uh, remember, realize the difference between a topic and a thesis. And then the other part of that uh, set of feedback for the mastery component was if you gave me, uh, if you um, put together good theses, right? So if you got 100, points total on that means you did all five, you knew the difference between a thesis and a topic, you showed the ability to compose a good thesis, and something you said in your thesis, the way you supported it, was in some way particularly insightful. If you got 90 points, it means you, you know, put together five good theses, um, you know, and they were good, but they weren't sort of really interesting or something like that. So a 90 is still a good grade. Um, the way that the grading rubrics are set up, it's actually quite hard to get 100 points on anything. Uh, it's easy enough to get sort of an A level grade on it, but it's very hard to get all of the points. To get all the points, you usually have to do something, as I said, original-ish or insightful. Um, and that's going to be true of uh, a lot of the presentation, or all of the presentation sequence assignments, really. Um, so you will have seen for the other things in week three that all of it was prefabricated feedback. Um, you know, indiv a few individuals may have on the active reading or the summary gotten some individualized feedback because they still haven't quite and got still haven't quite got the format of those submissions uh, right yet. But otherwise, you will have seen um, this formulaic feedback. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see all the feedback for their uh, thesis assignment in particular. That's the thing that I'm really uh, concerned with for week three. If 
you don't see that individualized feedback, uh, let me know. I know at least one student didn't seem to see it. So, um, you know, I don't know what that was about, but hopefully uh, everyone, excuse me, everyone else can see it. But let me know if you can. And let me know if you have any questions about that feedback. Moving into the actual recap of what we talked about for week three. Week three, we discussed radical skepticism, right? So recall, skepticism, very generally, is, uh, at least in the philosophical context, just means that you are denying that knowledge of something is possible. So, for instance, an external world skeptic denies that it's possible to have knowledge that there is an external world. Uh, a moral skeptic would deny that it's possible to have knowledge about what's right and wrong or what's good and bad. Um, a skeptic about other minds would specifically say that it's not possible to have knowledge of whether or not other people have minds. So you could be an other mind skeptic, but not an external world skeptic. Um, you could be a moral skeptic, but not an external world skeptic, so on and so forth. Now, radical skepticism is essentially the combination of every possible type of skepticism. It says whatever thing you're talking about, whatever you know, uh, phenomenon, whatever field of study, uh, it's not possible to have knowledge about that. Okay, not the external world, not other minds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Radical skepticism uh, tries to make this point by going directly after our sort of means of justification, uh, our ways of providing support for our beliefs. So that was the point of talking about the Sextus Empiricus stuff in the lectures. Sextus Empiricus and many others uh, throughout history who are sort of pushing this idea say that no matter what, we cannot provide sufficient evidence to justify our beliefs. Okay? Now, importantly, it's possible still that those beliefs are true. Um, so occasionally here and there when people were talking about radical skepticism in the thesis assignment and also in the, um, the, assignments for week, the other assignments for week three, they would talk as if skepticism uh, denied that there was truth or that, you know, truth was just sort of this vague idea to the skeptic. Uh, that's not the case. The skeptic can believe in objective truth. And, in fact, skeptics are probably more likely to believe in objective truth. Uh, well, maybe that's not true. Um, any case, the skeptic can believe in objective truth. Uh, they just say that we don't know when we are in possession of it. Right? So we may have a true belief, um, and, but that belief is going to be true kind of accidentally, not because we have found some good reasons, because we can't find good reasons. So uh, Sextus Empiricus said that there's only three ways you can try and justify a belief, and all of them fail. So because there are three ways, and no one of those ways can actually provide justification, that means there is no justification. Right? That's what we call an argument by exhaustion. You list all the possibilities and then show that none of them work. And so then you can say with confidence that, you know, there is, no, there is none of this thing. That's the idea. Um, so that's radical skepticism. Excuse me. Um, in the Descartes piece, that is actually just external world skepticism. Although uh, Descartes does in his meditations from which that argument that we looked at is drawn. He does argue for a more sweeping radical skepticism, but that's particularly external world skepticism that's being covered there. Um, and so there the idea is that uh, if we can't tell the difference between dreams and reality, then we don't know which of those we're in, right? If a dream experience ca can be sufficiently like real-world experience, uh, then dream experience and real-world experience are indistinguishable to us. If they're indistinguishable, then we can't sort of appeal to our experience and say, well, the way things seem to me show that I'm not in a dream, or the way things seem to me show that right now I'm in a dream. Uh, and if we can't appeal to that experience, then what are we going to do? We can't tell the difference. Now, What's tricky about this, and then this is sort of what goes to radical skepticism in general, there's a sense in which it doesn't matter whether you're actually dreaming or actually in the real world. So that's 
that's what I was getting at when I said that we might have true belief. So it might be true that we're not dreaming, but that's not the point. The point is, even if we aren't dreaming, we can't tell that we aren't dreaming because, again, allegedly, the dream experience is indistinguishable from the non-dream experience. This is how skeptical arguments very often work. The, most, the strongest skeptical arguments work this way. So, for instance, uh, in the contemporary uh, debate about skepticism, the kind of most difficult skeptical position to deal with is called the new evil demon hypothesis. Um, so that's a really bizarre name. Uh, it comes from the work of Descartes. So in Descartes' meditations, his radical skepticism is posed in this kind of thought experiment. He says, well, look, what if there is some extremely powerful deceiver, say a demon, who spends all of its time making sure that your experiences don't match with the way the world really is, manipulates your experiences to think, for instance, that you actually have hands and that you're walking around and you're doing stuff, but really, you know, you're just a brain in a vat or you're just this disembodied consciousness, which it's sort of manipulating somehow. The brain in the vat idea, that's a separate skeptical hypothesis. That's the one that uh, Moore is addressing in his um, anti-skeptical arguments. Um, so that one's not quite as radical as the, the evil demon hypothesis. But in any case, the way this new evil demon hypothesis, the kind of updated one, is framed is, again, in terms of this indistinguishability problem. And that's the big problem in contemporary epistemology that we're supposed to have to deal with is um, if it's possible that there is some type of uh, radical skeptical scenario in which our experiential evidence, uh, in which all of our evidence would be identical uh, Excuse me, let me rephrase that. If it's possible that we have identical sets of evidence in a radical deception scenario, like the new evil demon scenario, and then the regular real world scenario, if our evidence is the same, it's impossible to tell them apart. So that means, for all we know, we're in the radical deception scenario. That is, like the matrix, or, or you know, the evil demon, or uh, the brain and the bat type thing. So the skeptic isn't trying to say that we are dreaming. He's trying to say, for all we know, we're dreaming. And that's a big difference, right? Um, so there's a, you know, a whole lot of books and papers about trying to overcome this indistinguishability problem. And that's the problem in, in epistemology with trying to overcome radical skepticism. Um, so we see in Moore one of these attempts at an anti-skeptical strategy uh, where he's kind of going directly to the source again. He's saying, well, look, the skeptic says uh, we don't have justification. We don't have the right type of evidence to um, support these statements like I have hands, there is an external world. Um, Moore's strategy is to just basically deny that the skeptic has found anything interesting to deny that, um, that these indistinguishability hypotheses are strong enough to make us doubt you know, things like we have hands. But of course, as we looked at most people, as we looked at in the lectures, most people don't think this works uh, because he's not, really, he's not really proving that the skeptical scenarios are less um, likely uh, than the common sense scenarios. He's just saying, well, the common sense scenarios are the, are the things that we think are more likely. And thinking that something's likely and it being likely are, of course, not the same. So, you know, all he's really doing is, as we say, begging the question. He's putting forward a circular argument. Those two phrases, begging the question and putting forward a circular argument, are, um, are synonymous. They mean that you're assuming something in your argument that you are trying to prove at the end of the argument. So, of course, if you assume it in the beginning, it's trivially easy to prove it. You're just repeating yourself, basically. It's kind of like going, nuh uh, when someone says, uh, you know, you don't have any knowledge. Moore's just going, or he's saying, yeah, I do. And then that's the end of the argument. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, 
radical skepticism is one of those kind of really mind-bending hypotheses which it's very tempting to do what Moore does and say obviously uh, obviously this can't be right and what a lot of people did in their thesis assignment to kind of uh, counter radical skepticism and some people wrote this kind of stuff in their uh, individual summaries as well is they said well look obviously we do know stuff because you know here's all these here's all these famous geniuses and scientists and obviously they know things because they do stuff right um, we've built rockets and and all that kind of you know fancy thing we've cured diseases blah 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 well again that doesn't actually prove anything in the from the skeptics position you're just saying to the skeptic who says we don't have any knowledge you're just saying yes we do um, because once again all this appearance that we have built rockets and cured diseases and so on and so forth that could be just another thing that was simulated or that we were manipulated by the demon to think right so think about again the world of the matrix uh, all these people in the matrix think they're doing things all the time they think that they you know know how to bake bread they think that they know how to um, build electric cars so on and so forth but they're not actually doing anything any of those things they don't know how to do it they're just sort of being their brains are being poked with electricity to make them think that they're doing things and that they think that they know how to do things now there's a certain argument that some people hinted at that well if the world is this sort of comprehensively different than we think it is then knowledge is different than we think it is too and so there is this thing which is like illusion knowledge and we have that and that may be true but that's sort of not what the skeptic or excuse me that's not what the anti-skeptic wants the anti-skeptic wants real knowledge real world non-illusory knowledge so the the arguments here get very complicated um, but the point is that you can't simply insist obviously we do have knowledge against the skeptics claim that we don't in fact have it uh, the arguments have to be more subtle than that so for for a minute I do want to go back into the thesis articulation assignment um, and just talk here about uh, the different topics and some of the things that people sort of said about them so as I said there are five topics um, and you needed to give a thesis for each of them um, so there were a couple of them where people made a cons consistently sort of said the same types of things which I thought misunderstood the topic so everyone got the, the polyamory topic it's fairly straightforward um, they're the only consistent problems that I saw is that people were not necessarily putting forward an, a f philosophical a thesis about it um, so what we're going for here is so you see at the in this in the instructions a good thesis takes a topic and makes a philosophical claim about it so you know I didn't really explain what that means and so that's on me to a certain extent um, but a philosophical claim about something like polyamory about this type of practice is likely going to be an ethical claim um, a lot of people made psychological claims about its difficulty and that's that's a good thesis generally speaking right so I don't want to say that it's not I want to say in the context of a philosophical class you need to sort of go a step further right so some people who made this claim I say well to what does this difficulty mean for whether or not the practice is something that you should do right that's moving from a psychological claim to an ethical claim right so if the psychological claim is that it's impossible to have more than one romantic partner and people not to be destructively jealous if that is literally impossible for human beings then that would be a reason that they shouldn't uh, engage in this sort of uh, relationship dynamic so hopefully you know you see how that's a move from kind of a scientific psycho psychological claim to an ethical one and it's an ethical claim which is philosophical it, with respect to um, assisted suicide again you'd want to move from some kind of descriptive claim to an ethical one most people did pretty well in the assisted suicide claim you know they got to the idea that well look uh, it, you know there's something about people having a choice to do with their own lives what they will 
that's a, a sort of that's approaching an ethical claim. It's talking about the value of autonomy and that kind of thing. That was good there. Number two, with anarchy, um, most people seem to immediately associate anarchy with sort of chaos, which is uh, the connotation that that word does in fact have, at least in um, our culture. But of course, that's not what the topic description says. It's the view that all state authority is morally legitimate, morally illegitimate. So some people just sailed right past that and just directly went to the idea that oh, anarchy is bad because it would cause chaos. There wouldn't be any order. Um, I mean, maybe maybe it's true that in the absence of state authority, there would be disorder. But that's something that you sort of a you have to prove that and uh, B, again, that's not really what the topic is about. The topic says state authority is morally illegitimate, and that means that there's something wrong with it, even if it does bring order, even if it does bring safety. There's something morally bad about this type of authority. And so saying, well, it's not bad because it um, brings order and it brings safety is kind of arguing past the anarchist. Um, so, I mean, there's not necessarily a reason that you should know that um, other than, you know, I gave you something hinting to that in the definition of the topic. And we will look at that in a much later part of the course. There is one week where we're looking at uh, essentially uh, the philosophical anarchist position. So uh, just sort of giving you a heads up about that. Radical skepticism, I've already talked about for a while now. And then finally, moral relativism. This one, a lot of people had uh, trouble with. So a lot of people seem to think that moral relativism is just, is just the fact that there are differences in people's moral beliefs, right? Uh, so moral relativism on that view is obviously true because it's obviously true that people have morally different beliefs. But moral relativism, as I said in feedback to people, is more than that. It's more than just observing that people have different sets of moral beliefs. It's saying additionally that each of those sets of moral beliefs is correct, right? Even when they are, even when they say directly opposite things, the relativist can claim that both of those moral beliefs are correct. So if I say, for instance, that um, abortion is morally permissible, and you say that abortion is morally impermissible, according to the relativist, it is possible that both of us are correct, right? Now, of course, that sounds weird because that's like letting it be true that it's raining and it's also not raining is correct. So there's supposed to be some kind of uh, tension that needs to be resolved, some kind of problem that needs to be fixed for moral relativism to be true. How can it be true that A and also not A at the same time? The way the relativist fixes this, or attempts to fix it, is say that, oh, the truth value, right, whether or not this moral rule applies, whether or not this moral statement is true, is different from one context to the next. So the most, the sort of usual way that people talk about this is in terms of cultures, right? Some people talk about it in terms of individuals, right? So a lot of you seem to have this um, intuition that what is moral is different from person to person. So you, you may mean more than just that various people have different moral beliefs. You may mean that actually what different people should do, what is right for me, what is right for you, is just different. Um, it's sort of my own business, as it were. Now, taking that seriously, for instance, going back to this abortion example, one could say that for so-and-so, uh, abortion is morally permissible. And then, you know, their next-door neighbor, uh, the person standing right next to them, for that person, uh, you know, for so-and-so, number two, uh, abortion is impermissible. That's the kind of thing that you have to agree with, that kind of statement, uh, if you are putting forward the subjectivist uh, view of morality, the idea that the relevant context across which moral statements truth changes, across which the applicability of moral rules changes, is the individual person. 
On the other hand, if you say it's at the level of cultures, then you'd say something like, again, I'm going to stick with this example, in um, X land, uh, abortion is morally acceptable. In Y land, abortion is morally unacceptable. These two facts don't contradict each other because the way morality is, not just what people believe, but the way morality actually is, is different in X land and Y land, right? Importantly, and I said this to people in their feedback, um, the cultural level relativism allows you to illustrate that it's not mere difference in belief that matters, right? So in X land, we say, oh, the, uh, abortion is morally permissible in X land, right? That's, that's the story that we have. Well, suppose in X land there lives Fred, and Fred believes that abortion is not morally acceptable. Well, because uh, we're going with a cultural relativism here, uh, he's just wrong in his culture, right? In X land, uh, abortion is morally acceptable. He thinks it isn't. He's just wrong in the context of that culture. If Fred went over to Y land, he would be correct, right? I mean, this is a little bit of a rough uh, and slightly inaccurate way of putting it, but that's the general idea. You fix, you figure out what level you think makes a relevant difference in terms of morality, and then that's, that's where it happens. If you thought that morality was species relative, then everything would be the same, morally speaking, for human beings, but then it'd be different for Martians. So if in this picture, the species level relativism, um, if we determined somehow uh, that abortion was morally permissible for human beings, then it doesn't matter if you disagree, you're wrong. If the, Mar if the Martians think that abortion is morally impermissible and you go over to the Martians, well, according to them, you are right. And amongst the Martians, you are correct, but amongst the humans, you are wrong. So that's why just noting that people have different beliefs isn't yet enough to establish some kind of moral relativism. And there's relativism about, you know, more things than, than, than morality. There are uh, relativist positions about truth, like in general, uh, moral, uh, the relativist positions about um, epistemic requirements, so on and so forth. And in each of these cases, it's very important that you identify the, the level at which the context, the rules are fixed. So it could be at the culture, it could be at the species, it could be all the way down at the individual, it could be some group that's like smaller than cultures, we could have, you know, oh, it's not just like X land versus Y land, it's um, engineers versus artists, right? Um, once you start thinking about it this way, there are a baffling number of contexts which you could sort of point out as being the relevant ones across which, in our case, moral rules and moral truths change. So it's that relativism one and the anarchy one which people seemed to have the most trouble getting a grasp on the topic itself. And so hopefully this feedback here and then the feedback in um, your individual feedback helps you uh, get a grip on that. So just generally speaking, so a topic, again, is this thing, right, the, the word and then the description of that phenomenon that's, that the word talks about. The thesis, then, is a statement, an answer to a question. So instead of you know, the topic just being peanut butter, you can imagine that the, the topic is what variety of peanut butter is best? And then, of course, your thesis could be, you could be distinguishing crunchy versus creamy, or you could distinguish different brands of peanut butter. You could say, oh, Smucker's is the best for these reasons. Now, of course, this here, since peanut butter, I mean, it's really hard to make a philosophical thesis about peanut butter. Um, so this thesis isn't really philosophical, but you can, it's easier for these other topics. So for... Um, for polyamory, you could say the question you could pose the question is something like: Are uh, polyamorous relationships ethically acceptable? And your answer, that is your thesis, would be: Yes, they are because um, uh, relationships are a matter of individual preference, and so long as everyone is aware of and consenting to the dynamic, then they are acceptable. Right? That would be a thesis. That would be a philosophical thesis. It's about 
their ethical acceptability and that it's giving reasons for or against their ethical acceptability. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, if you have any further questions about the week three uh, assignments and then especially the thesis articulation assignment, feel free to email me, some people already have. Um, and otherwise, uh, get on with the, 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 the current week's assignments. Um, remember that now in week five and then when I start grading the week four stuff, uh, the grading is fully sort of strict now uh, since you've had a good amount of time, three weeks, to get accustomed to what the assignments uh, require from you. You've had a couple rounds of feedback to kind of um, uh, hone in on uh, what you need to do. And so now I will hold you to a bit of a higher uh, expectation.